I want to I want to ask you because maybe somebody in here does doesn't know how to do this, but I want you to go back when you were a kid, and I want you to remember um, learning to ride a bike. I don't know if you can remember that. Um, <clears throat> how about learning to swim? That was a scary moment for me. Um, my dad told me I was going in the pool one way or the other. Um, I'm still a little scarred from that one, um, it, but, you know, but, but it may also be, um, maybe you grew up around um, a lake or water, and you remember that first time you water skied, or maybe, maybe you grew up in the mountains, and you, you, you've been able to snow ski, or, or, may, or maybe it was asking somebody out. We, we, we all know that there are things in our life, and it's, it's interesting how it works, because when you're on the side of not knowing how to ride the bike, there's other people on the other side that have already ridden the bike and know how to ride the bike that are trying to convince you that learning to ride the bike will be the greatest thing that you could ever do. And if you're on this side, they sometimes the way they're saying it makes it feel like they're pressuring you or they're, or they're pushing you or they're coercing you or they're manipulating you. And they're like, you know, you can do this. It's gonna be the greatest thing in the world. You're gonna be driving this bike. The wind's gonna be going through your hair. It's gonna be awesome. And of course, when you're on the other side, you're like, don't take off the training wheels at all. I rebuke all of you all and your positivity, you know, um, or swimming. And, there, and there's always that, that apprehension to, 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 to things that, that now, when we get on the other side of it, we become those people that go, no, you can do it. And, and the person on the other side's going, calm down. You know, there's a lot of fear and apprehension. And so I think all of us can relate. And there's probably something in your life where you can relate, whether it's riding a bike or swimming or whether it's maybe you jumped out of an airplane and you remember what that was like. And I've never done that. Um, I don't plan on doing that. Somebody'd have to kick me out of that at this point. But, uh, but that being said, I think all of us know what it's like to have to take that step where there's some apprehension, where there's some fear, where there's some questions. And, and, and of course, the people on the other side, sometimes is, as good as they may intend to be, can oftentimes be a little off-putting to you and me when we're on the other side and we've not learned how to swim or we've not learned how to ride that bike. And so I say all of that because I think everybody here at some level can relate to that. You know what it's like to have that, oh, I just don't know that I wanna take off those training wheels. I don't know that I wanna put my head under the water. I don't know that I wanna put these water skis on and, 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 and come out um, when, when the boat goes. I've watched people flip I, 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 and people in the boat, you can do it, you can do it. And you're like, no, I can't, you know, and, and, and we all know that. And so the reason I mention that is because when it comes to Christianity and it comes to walking with the Lord, there are so many things about following Jesus that can, that can be that step where we go, oh, I don't know. I'm a little apprehensive. Um, there's a little bit of fear. I just don't know. And, and, and Christianity has got a lot of those things. And there's people on the other side going, no, you can do it, man. You can share your faith. No, you can do it. You can go to that prayer meeting. No, you can pray out loud. And I don't know about you, but does anybody ever remember the first time you got asked to pray out loud? I, I, I remember mine. It wasn't very good. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and, and I say that because the people on the other side, they, they, they mean well, but sometimes it doesn't always feel that way. But when it comes to Christianity and all these things, this is why we're doing this series called Just Take the Next Step. Uh, there's so many things that I wanna talk to you about, about taking that next step. There is one part of Christianity, and, and you know this and I know this, and all of us know this. There's, there's one aspect of Christianity that sort of stands above it all when it comes to giving that feeling of apprehension and the, the little bit of, oh, I, I don't know, I can't believe this. And, and you know this and I know that, everybody records it, it's the, the statistics are there, is that whenever you talk about taking the next step in generosity or giving, all of a sudden it's like everybody goes, ah. You know, and if you're new here and you're going, how did I show up on the weekend they're, surely they're not gonna talk about giving right now. But let me, let me, let me cause I wanna I want make sure that you hear this from me. First of all, last year, I did not do one message on giving, didn't do one, okay? And so typically I try to do one at the beginning of the year, but I wanna do this differently because I already know, like I'm, I'm totally aware of when you talk about taking that next step in giving, people, walls go up. I mean, m more than this, like the, you, some of you are already are trying to figure out how you can get some concrete blocks and put in front of you to shield yourself from whatever I'm gonna say. But, but what I wanna show you is this, because I, this is what I want you to see. If we did not have generosity in a local church, if there weren't people that gave, and let me, let me make this very clear, giving is not just 
finances. G- g- giving, we, we've got this nice little thing that we say in church. Um, it, it's not really biblical in terms of like the names, but the, the ideas are, is that to give, you have your talent, you have your time, and you have your treasure. And, and all of those things are part of giving. All of those things are part of generosity. So when you talk about you know, being a generous person, um, do you give your time? to things other than yourself? Do you give your talent um, uh, to other things other than just things for yourself or to to, to make sure that you make ends meet? And do you give your treasure? Are you willing to give financially to things? And all of that is a part of giving and generosity. Let, let, Let me show you something. If the local church, specifically Grace, if this church were not generous, let, let, let me, let me, sort of show you some things up here. I I could spend all weekend on this. I wanna just take some snippets of some things. And I also wanna tell you about some things that are are going on. But but I wanna give you some some thoughts here. So we have right now at Grace Community Church, there there are 3,000 people, sometimes it's 3,200, 3,300, but just use it to round it off. um, 3,000 people that physically come and sit in chairs on the weekend here at Grace. Let, Let me tell you something, that would not be a possibility if it weren't for the generous hearts of people at Grace that gave so that we could purchase this land and so that we could build this building so that we could do the things that we do, it wouldn't happen. And, and, and I'm gonna say this to you and I think you will agree with me on this is that there's, if it was 3,001 or if it were 3,002, like who would not want for someone to get in here and hear the gospel and hear about Jesus and hear what he can do? So it's like, we, we wanna continue to reach, reach more people, but that would not happen. 12 years ago, 12, 12 years ago, we were in a building with about 20 people. And in over 12 years, this has happened. And, and I'm gonna tell you something, people have been, so many people have been generous and kind and giving and all of this stuff. And that's why we're here. Look, look at this, moving, we, we, we're already w- way past 300. We're moving towards 400 children every weekend, 11 years and younger that roll through this building on a weekend. That's a lot of kids. You know I mean? That's just a lot of kids. But l- listen, <clears throat> listen to me. You can't take care of the kids if you don't have the things that they need. Curriculum, we have sound equipment, we have things that we, we do and, and, and crafts and all. There's, there's not a truck that comes by churches every Saturday and says, here's your free children stuff. It just doesn't work that way. And, and so how are we able to do those things? Because of generosity, because people are generous. Our youth and young adult ministries are flourishing. I mean, they're, they're, we're, we're having to, to expand here to, 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 to give them more room because we need more room. Just online, we, we have a thousand people and, and, and it's sometimes more, but <clears throat> just, I'm just trying to be, and I'm conservative. I mean, I, I, I grew up in a church where the, the pastor would have been like, we have 5,000 people that come every weekend. He's like, I know some people are pregnant. You got to count them. And, and I know some people, you know, I mean, he's, he's like, no, you just count. We, we, we have two people that count in every service so that we get it right. Because I can't stand bad data. Like it just, you know, like if it's three people that showed up, it's three people that showed up. I don't wanna hear five people showed up. I wanna know, but listen to this. We have a thousand people that tune in online at the service times. And that doesn't mean there's, there's a lot more that watch it. Okay, but can I tell you something? We wouldn't be able to reach those people if we didn't have those cameras, if we didn't have the soundboard. We got a soundboard back behind the platform where somebody's back there in a room mixing sound, not for you, but for the people that listen online. We couldn't do any of those things. We, we couldn't reach the people on social media. We, we, we got on a TikTok. You familiar? It's this pagan platform. You ever heard of TikTok? I mean, I, 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 I think TikTok is like Greek for Satan. Um, it, it's, it's, it's like, don't let your kids on TikTok. Just, I don't normally get weighed into this. Get them off that thing. It's terrible. But anyway, we waited on the TikTok and decided to preach the gospel on TikTok. Got 40,000 followers. Okay. And so we, we, We couldn't do that if we didn't have cameras, if we didn't have soundboards, if we didn't have microphones. Guess what? There's not a truck that rolls up once a month to church. How many microphones do you all need? We've got them for you. How many sound? No, it it requires resources and it requires generosity. We have 5,000 subscribers on, on a YouTube channel where all we do is teach the Bible and people, it's growing every day and and people are going there to learn about scripture and so on and so forth. If you continue on here, we have middle school services. So check this out. We have a great relationship with Newgate Montessori School right down the street. And 
we, we, we have such a good relationship with them. We asked them, we said, hey, is there any way that we could use that building on Sunday so that our middle school kids could have church service? And they said, yeah, so now we have a bus and it's, it's multiple buses now because we got to take bus loads. We take middle school kids at, at 10 o'clock to the Newgate School and they have their own church service and then are bused back and we're planning on adding to that so that, so that we have more of those services. We couldn't do that if it were not for the generosity of the people here at Grace. We, we closed on the property across the street. We now own this piece of property across the street, okay? And, 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 we're, and we're, gonna, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna clear it off and we're gonna put parking because most of you all are smart. You come at a different time than the 10 a.m. service here at Grace. The 10 a.m. service here at Grace, it's like, I don't even know what you liken it to because the cars just go down Telecommunications Parkway as far as you can see because there's no parking. There are trucks on the side of the road. There's, there's, we, we line up under the portico here. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. There's not enough seats in the sanctuary. They have people sit outside and, and watch the TV out there. Um, well, we need more parking. So we're gonna, we're gonna clear that off and get more parking. Um, n- not only that, but we, we moved the staff across the street to the insurance building. And so they have, we now have offices over there because we're gonna blow out the whole space back here to create a room that will seat three to 400 people because we need space for our youth and young adults because we don't have space. And so let me tell you something, that doesn't happen just because somebody rolls in and goes, you know what I think I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna donate my time to blow out the whole place. And, but no, it, it requires resources. If we didn't have the generosity of our church, we couldn't do those things. Um, the balcony and the parking lot, people ask, when's that going on? Well, th- there's such a thing called permits. And they're of the devil too. <clears throat> They, they just need to be rebuked. I don't know why um, it, it's so difficult. I, I'm, I, I'm from Kentucky. You, you know, when you, you just looked and said, build a shed. We said, we're gonna build a shed. Nobody thought about going downtown and asking somebody if we could build a shed. Okay, here in Sarasota, they frown upon that. So, so you gotta get these, these things called permits. You know what I'm talking about, I'm being funny. But, but, but the permits probably will be done April, May-ish. And so we wanna get through Easter, um, probably June 1st is when we'll start doing all the stuff. It will be in for sure by Christmas, um, but that, that's gonna be going on. We're gonna add another three, 400 seats. We're actually gonna add another three or 400 seats back there as well. Um, if we had overflow um, and we can put a live band back there, there's things that we can do, but we're, we're growing. There's sort of, we're busting at the seams in, in, in every way. And all of this takes place because some of you all, majority, to be honest with you, decided that you were gonna get on the bike and you were gonna ride and, and you were generous. And, and you know this and I know that, people who are generous are happier. They usually live longer. There's so many stats about generous people. You know you've met this stingy person, right? If you're it, I'm not trying to call you out or be snarky, okay? Don't think that I'm giving you a hard time. But, but, but the point is, we know this. And so what I wanna do is, is I wanna try to go into a passage of scripture that, that I suspect the majority of us are not that familiar with. Um, and Paul is writing to a church and he's trying to get them to learn how to ride a bike. He's trying to help them learn how to swim. And it's, it's a great couple of chapters. I'm not gonna be able to go through the whole couple of chapters. I'm gonna sort of highlight some things, but, but this may be the first time. You, maybe you've read the Bible before, you know, the, the yearly Bible, but it's probably a passage of scripture that you don't remember um, if you have read it, because typically th- there's ways our brains work and there's certain things we remember and certain things that we don't. Um, and, and you may have never heard this passage before, um, but, but what I wanna do is I wanna give you a little bit of background so that you can understand what Paul's doing and, and, and why this is important and why being generous and why taking the next step in our generosity wherever we're at is, is is something to at least think about. It's at least something to consider. Just like if I were to say, hey, take a next step in your prayer life or your worship life or your your commitment to sharing Christ. You all would go, yeah, okay, well, let's let's talk about being more generous because you know and I know that you can't hang a lot around Jesus. You can't really devote yourself to Jesus and not somehow be kind and generous and, and, and helpful and all those things to other people. So Paul has written to a church 
um, that's located on the Peloponnese between uh, um, Athens and Greece. Um, it's, it's the church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth is an interesting study in and of itself um, because it, it's a selfish church. Um, it's not a very spiritual church. Um, there's a lot of problems in the church at Corinth. In fact, it's probably the worst example of what it looks like to be a Christian of the churches that we, that we have um, in, in Scripture. Um, that they, they all think they know everything. Um, that they, 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 they have unchecked sin. Um, they have all kinds of problems going on. They're fighting about food and all the things and the religions going on around. That they're mad at each other. They're, they're haughty. They're prideful. Um, they, they don't understand spiritual gifts. Paul actually tells them in 1 Corinthians 11 that it would be better that they don't even come together as a church. Can you, can you imagine if like Paul rolled in here and said, hey, yeah, you guys would just be better to shut down than do what you do. Man, I, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, man, I want to get this right. I mean, he has to tell him, he's like, when you guys come together, it's actually not for the better, it's for the worse. Their communion's messed up, their spiritual gifts are messed up, their order of service is messed up, and they don't even understand the resurrection very well. So it's pretty, pretty messed up church. But I'm gonna tell you something, thank God the church at Corinth is so messed up because at least it lets me know that I got a shot. Don't you sometimes feel that way when you read scripture? Like, man, thank God that person was in scripture because I can relate, you know? So he's writing, and this is in 2 Corinthians, and Paul is on his third missionary journey, and Paul has something that he wants to do. He wants to take up an offering for the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem that have fallen on very difficult times. And you can read about this in places like Galatians 2, 1 Corinthians 16, um, you can read about it in, in, the, in the book of Acts. Um, Luke talks about it. Um, he's got this sort of idea that he wants to take up an offering and, and he, wants, he wants the Gentile churches to participate in this for, for a couple of reasons. Because in Romans 15, he mentions it as well, the, the offering to, to Jerusalem. He's like, hey, the gospel came from Jerusalem. You guys spiritually have been awakened. You, you've come to know Jesus because the gospel came out of Jerusalem. So why don't you help them financially? He's not saying that that's, it's tit for tat that because you got spiritual stuff that you need to now give you know, money. But the point is, is he's saying, help them out. And, and so he's got this idea of helping them out. And he's also wanting to foster these good relationships between Jew and Gentile Christians. He doesn't want them to fight and have, have problems. So he's, he's trying to get people in. Well, the problem is, is the church at Corinth, which he's talked to them about this before, the church at Corinth is not a very spiritual church. And where you find um, a non-spiritual church, you usually find a non-generous church because spirituality and generosity go together. Um, because when, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you're generous and kind and all those things that you become because that's just what, that's what it is to be a follower of Jesus is to be kind and generous and love people and all of that. Turn the other cheek. We all know that. So he, he writes to them and, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, hey, I, I wanna help you ride the bike. Like, like I, I wanna help you swim, but I don't wanna do it in a way that's off-putting. I don't wanna do it in a way that you feel like I'm pushing you or anything, but I just, I just wanna lay it out to you. And so by way of the Corinthian correspondence, by way of Paul helping them to understand generosity, um, we learn a little bit about generosity. So let's look at this passage. It's, uh, you could go home and read it. It's 2 Corinthians chapter eight and 2 Corinthians chapter nine. I won't be able to go through all of it, but I wanna go through some of it. And, and, and like I said, for some of y'all, this may be the first time you've seen this or the first time you've maybe paid attention to this, but I think it's something that's worth at least looking at because you know me and you know this about your pastor. You know that there's not one word or one passage of scripture that I'm scared of teaching on. We'll teach on all of it. So if it's 2 Corinthians eight and nine, that's what we're gonna talk about. So, and you know that, we believe the Bible is the word of God here, and that may be in the minority in today's world, but I can tell you right now, as long as I'm the pastor at Grace, we will teach and preach the word of God authoritatively. Okay, so <clears throat> let's, uh, let's, let's, let's get to work here. He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Now, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, they think they know everything. You ever met a know-it-all? You ever been one? Um, so he, he, he uses this phrase and it's sort of poking. He keeps saying, do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know? And he says, we want you to know. So there's a little bit of a poke here because they think they know everything. He says, we want you to know brothers 
about the grace of God that has been given. Now, typically, when we hear the word grace, we think of unmerited favor, we think of salvation, we think of the work of God that God does in our hearts and lives, which is, which is fine. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about God's grace working in a church. He says, I want you to know about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. It'd be Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. He goes, I want you to know, man, God has done something incredible in these people's lives. He goes, I want you to lean in here because this is really, really, really good. He says, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. It's like, whoa. So they're in a severe test of affliction. What's probably going on in these churches is because of them accepting Christ and following Jesus, they, they have started to lose their jobs. And many of them were in trade guilds. And what's happened is, is they've been kicked out of the trade guilds which means that they're going through a lot of problems and they're in extreme poverty. He says, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. Now, lean in here. Typically speaking, we don't think severe affliction and extreme poverty would lead people to have an abundance of joy. Can I tell you something? I want you to hear me because, because I, I'm, I, as long as I got breath in my lungs, I'm gonna teach and preach scripture the way it is. We're never promised this perfect life and rainbows and butterflies as Christians. In fact, oftentimes we're told that there's going to be difficulty in, 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 in our lives. But what we're, we are told that we should have, regardless of any situation that we're in, we should have joy. We, we should be people that have a joy that comes from the fact that we know the end of the book. We know we're on the team that wins. So no matter what we see here, no matter what's going on here, we've got a hope that gives us joy in the midst of whatever it is that we find ourselves in. And, and, that's, and that's, that's good Christian teaching. Good Christian teaching isn't come follow Jesus and everything's gonna go perfect. That's, that's heresy is what that is. Good biblical teaching says, hey, Jesus saves you and me, but this world's pretty tough and it's not put back to right yet. And there's gonna be a lot of problems. But the one thing Jesus can give you and me in the midst of difficulty is joy. Okay, so he says, I wanna tell you about the grace of God that's happened. These people that are going through a severe test of affliction and poverty, they've got so much joy that it's overflowed in their life in a wealth of generosity. You go, how in the world could anybody be generous when they're going through affliction and extreme poverty? Paul says, no, no, you, you, gotta, you gotta lean in here, guys. I mean, I, I, know, I, know, I know you guys are probably wondering, you know, the church of Corinth, whether you should participate in this, whether you should be generous or whatever. He says, but man, let, let, me, let me tell you about these people in, 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 in Macedonia. Let me tell you about them. They, they, they overflowed. He says, in fact, he says, I want, you, I want you to follow me. He says, they gave according to their means. This is, this is a biblical principle that, that you, you usually you can't give what you don't have. He says, so they, they gave according to their means, which was not much because it's not, it's not the amount. It's, it's, it's what you have and how you respond, what I have and how I respond to what I have. He goes, they, they, he goes, they gave according to their means. He goes, actually, as I can testify, they gave beyond their means. They, they, they went even further than, the, and these were people that were in severe affliction and extreme poverty. I hear people all the time go, you know, well, you know, I really can't be that generous because no, these people were in, in bad shape and, and they were generous. And he says, but they did it of their own accord. Nobody had to push them. Nobody had to sit them on the bike kicking and screaming. Nobody had to throw them in the pool. Nobody had to strap the skis on and make them. They did it of their own accord. I want to tell you about the grace that hit this church and in, 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 in the churches in Macedonia, how God was working in them and doing this. And listen, it gets even better. He says, begging us. <laughs> That's crazy. These people were in severe affliction and poverty, begging us. Like they, we didn't have to ask. They were begging us. What? 
for the favor. They, they, they understood something. They understood that there's something about being generous that, that brings favor in, into our lives. And I, listen, I know the people on TV and other places have, have made that thing, you know, messed up where they could give to God and he's gonna give you back all these things and whatever else. It's not, it's not the way it works. What I am telling you is this though, is when you're generous and you give and you serve God and you follow God and you do the things that God's called you to do, you, you, you have favor in your life. And it may, not, it may not always look like a big car or a big house, but you have favor. There's something about what God does in us when we follow what he tells us to do that's supernatural. It's just supernatural. And, and maybe, you're, maybe you're here and, and you've got the training wheels on right now and you can't, you're like, eh, I don't really know. I, I can only tell you for, for, for those that have, have, have given and served and loved and poured into others, I, I can tell you there's something God does in you that's pretty cool. It's it just, it's cool. So they begged us earnestly for taking part in the relief of the saints. It's like, man, they wanted to be in completely. And this not as we expected. We didn't really expect that, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, which is where all this usually happens. Everything happens in our Christian life when we first give ourselves to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Now, Paul continues to talk about this till he gets to chapter nine and then he sort of sums it up. He does this three verse summary. He says, here's the point I'm trying to make. And you can go read the ending of chapter eight and into chapter nine. But he says, this is the point that I wanna make. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. For Paul, this is a a spiritual principle, that that when we're generous and we're kind, that that there are things that come back to us. We don't do it for those reasons, but but that's, that's the case. And he says, but each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Like we, we, we can't force you onto the bike. We can't push you in the pool. We can't push your head under. He says, he's decided his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion for what God loves. God loves somebody riding a bike that's having a ball. God loves somebody in the pool that's splashing and having a ball. God, God loves somebody who's on water skis and kicks off one and goes you know, to, to, to a single seat. He wants people cheerful in, 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 in what he does. And, and, and then here's, here's sort of the, 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 the crux of it. He says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things and at all times, you may abound in every good work. This is, this is really the issue of, of what it is when a church is generous is that you don't have to miss out on the opportunities to do the good deeds. You can pay off school lunches. You can pay off medical debt. You can do the things that we do. You can put movies on at Waterside. You can grab a bus and put middle school kids on there. You can, you can help people that are going through difficulty. You can pass out you know, gift cards during COVID. You can do the things that, that we did because the generosity was there and you don't miss any good work. And, and that's, that's really the, 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 the reason when we talk about you know, giving and we talk about being generous. It's, it's not what God wants from you and me. It's what he wants for you and me. A generous heart really makes a difference. Let me just give you a couple of real quick take-homes. Um, first of all, generosity is a grace that the Lord gives us as we submit ourselves to him. I, I, I readily concur that there are some people that, that, that are naturally generous. That's just who they are. Okay, but most of us, and let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. Most of us wanna make sure that we're taken care of before we do something for somebody else. Can I get an amen? Will you be that honest? We, we, we do. You know, like if you got a bowl of cereal, you're like, no, I might give you a couple of my cinnamon toast crunches. <laughs> but, you know, um, you know my, my, my two dogs, they're, they're cockapoos. Um, they're more on the poo side than the, um, so, uh, but uh, um, uh, you, you can see when they go to the bowl, the, the one's bigger, you know, and they, they do their thing, you know, they got, you know, I, they got some code, dogs have some code, but, but, but typically we wanna take care of ourselves first. G- generosity is a grace. It's something that we, that's imparted to us is we devote ourselves to the Lord. And you can see here in the passage, we want you to know about the grace of God that's been given. You can see that in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that the good works can be done, that you have everything that you need so that you may abound in every good work, that anything that needs to go on, you can do. So so generosity is something that starts with you and me and our commitment to the Lord and giving, to our, giving our hearts and lives to the Lord and spending time with him, it's something that he does in us. 
Second, generosity is not really contingent upon what we have. We, we, we think that way as Americans. Um, I've had so many people <clears throat> over the years that have said, you know, I really want to participate in this thing that you all are doing, but, you know, I, I don't have, I'm like, man, you don't, we, we've done a terrible job of teaching them. It's not the amount. It's just not. It's, it's, it's what, what do we have and how are we stewarding what it is that we have? I, I can tell you there's people in churches that, that have very little who are far more generous than people who write very big checks but could write much, much bigger checks if they, if they wanted to. And that's not to be snarky or give anybody a hard time. It's just, it's not. Because you see here, he says, in their abundance or in their extreme poverty, like most of us wouldn't think that people who were in extreme poverty could overflow in a wealth of generosity. But that's the, that's the beauty of Christianity. Christianity is not like <clears throat> everything else. God doesn't look at it the way everybody else looks at it. He doesn't look at it the amount. He looks at what did you do with what you had? There's this great story. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it was in World War II. And, um, you know, after, you know, Japan had, had um, you know, surrendered and they had all the people out on the, the deck of the aircraft carrier and they, 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 would, they would bring up the fighter pilots and they would, they would give them pins for the planes that they had, had shot down. And, you know, and maybe one got three and one got five or one got 10, I don't, you know, you know and everybody. <clears throat> and then they, they called out the name of the mechanic. He said, let me call him my name for him. And they said, no, you gotta come up here. And, and they started pinning these planes on him. And he's like getting more pins than, anybody else. And he's like, well, I, uh, hold on. You, I, I'm not a fighter pilot. I, I didn't, I, you, you don't understand. You got the wrong guy. They're like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. None of those guys that got those pins would have been able to get those pins if it weren't for you that was working on the plane. So you get all the pins that everybody else got, all of them together go on you because you're the one that made the planes work so they could go do what they do. Listen to me, that's the way God's economy is. He's not, it's, sometimes we look at the big fancy stuff and, and all of that stuff. What God's looking for is he's just looking for you and me to be generous and kind with what we do have. Don't look around. Don't worry about somebody else's number, any of that stuff. Just, just be you because generosity is not contingent upon all the things that we have. It's an attitude of our heart. And the last thing, and this is the thing I wanna do, what are the next steps? Like, because I get asked this all the time. What are the next steps <clears throat> that I could take as a person here at Grace that, that so, so, so let's start at the bare minimum. There's probably some people in here that you come and you, you hang out, we're glad you're here and you, you, don't, you don't give anything, that's fine. We're not, like, we're not, when we get done here, there's not people outside with cards. There's not a phlebotomist out there. I mean, there's not, that's not what we do here, okay, at all. But, but what I'm saying is, is, so your next step would be to just start to, to, to get involved. And, and that's, that's up to you. That has to be something that comes from your heart. But what I decided to do is I, I, got, I, got, I had some fun, is, is I wanted to give you some building blocks here on how to, to do this. So the first people that <clears throat> the next step would be to be an occasional giver. And, and, and some of that, some of you all are there. And I wanna make sure, I want you to hear this because it's important. If you're an occasional giver, you have no idea how important your occasional gifts mean to what we do here. It's important. Is, now, can you take a next step? Yes, you can. But I don't want you to hear your pastor give anybody a hard time. We, we appreciate every single person that gives anything that gives because your gifts and what you do helps connect people to Jesus and helps make the ministries that we do here at Grace significant. So, so please don't hear anything other than, hey, I appreciate you, but can you take the next step? Yes. And so if you're an occasional giver, the next step for you would be to be what I call a percentage giver. Now you can call this whatever you want to call it. Um, but for me, a percentage giver is someone who gives sort of a set amount on a regular basis. And, and that may be where you're at right now. You go, well, you know, I give X about, and it's just sort of on your little, you know, website thing. And it's just X amount. And, and that's great. We, we, we need you too. We love you. Thank you for what you do. You make a difference in every, every ministry that we do. If you give a penny, you're a part of what goes on here. It's, just, it's so important that you hear that. But the next step from an occasional giver would be to be a percentage giver, would be to say, okay, we're gonna sit down around the table and we're gonna figure out 
well, you know, we can give this on a, on a regular basis. And that's the next step. Now, if you wanna take the next step, and this is, this is a biblical step, and, and, and you, you, you can take, you can go from one step to another, you, you can jump more. To, okay. The next would be to be what we call a tither. And this word has such a bad connotation in church. It's the word people hate. Um, t- tithing means 10%. And, and <clears throat> where that comes from is the Bible. It doesn't come from like church people that decided, yeah, how much do we want? Let's get 10% from everybody. No, no, <clears throat> it, it comes from the Bible. And it's not, it's in the law, but it predates the law. Abraham tithed. So, so tithing, giving 10% is not tied up in the law, although the law does talk about it. Tithing is giving 10%. And in Malachi in chapter three, he says that we bring the tithe to the storehouse. Key, key, key word there. You don't give a tithe, you bring it. Because the Lord considers that is his. He doesn't consider that as yours, mine. He says, you can live on 90%, but 10% is mine. And, and, and so when you read in scripture and you see these things, that the reason we talk about this is because that's a biblical thing, but you may not be there and that's okay. Because just like in, in, in your prayer life, some people can pray for five minutes, some people can pray for an hour, some people can share Jesus, some people can't. There's nobody's, your pastor's not gonna give you a hard time. I'm just saying, here are some steps that you can make if you wanna go, what is my next step? What's the next step after people who are tithers? Well, then there is above and beyond giving. And, and what, what you do there is you, you, you're a tither, but then you decide that you wanna do more than that. And so you go above and beyond that. And, and many of you all are there. And you may go, well, that sounds like a pretty good spot to be. You know, so I'm, I'm there. Well, th- there's, there's, there's the, the next step. And this is the step that I really believe God wants to get us all to, whether we get there in this life or not is a whole nother story, but it's a lifestyle of generosity. It's where just everything you do, everything that you're a part of, you just want to do whatever you can to be a part of helping further the kingdom. In other words, when, when they sing, I surrender 10%. No, it's I surrender all, right? So, 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 so lifestyle generosity says, no, this is, this is where I wanna be. So all I wanna say is this, this gives you some idea of what you can pray and ask God to work in your heart. And that's all I'm asking. We won't do this again this year. We may not even do it next year. The bottom line is though, is giving is a biblical thing. And I think that in all sincerity, because I've really tried hard, I, I think that I just gave a pretty good message on giving. It's not nasty or ugly or, you know, um, you know and I know I'll get, I'll get some emails. I, you know, I, I, I love you. I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I, I'm just telling you that giving is biblical and, and, it, and it is part of scripture. And if you really believe the Bible is the word of God, you can't get away from talking about some of these things periodically. And all I want you to do is all I want you to do as your pastor is to say, how do I wanna get on that bike? How do I wanna get into that pool? How do I wanna put on those skis? That's, you and God gotta work that out, not me. I'm not here to coerce anybody. I'm not here to push anybody. I'm not here to try to get, because let me tell you something. Our church is very healthy and our church is in a great shape. I mean, you ought to go home seriously and get on your knees when you look at what's going on in the church world in America, you ought to thank God for Grace Community Church because this church is a healthy, healthy church. Very healthy. And, and it's healthy because of the generosity of the people that go here. So I wanna thank you for your generosity. I wanna thank you for your giving. I wanna thank you for supporting the things that we do. And I just wanna ask you, how can you take the next step. I have to ask myself the same question. Me and Mindy have to ask ourselves the same. We do it. We do. We, we do regularly, but especially every year we sort of sit down. Wait, what are we, we going to do next? What's the, what's the next thing? I, 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 she, she's got a heart for um, Compassion International kids. Um, I literally don't know how many other kids we have at this point because it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, you know, um, Jeremy Camp was here a few years back and he was trying to get to a certain number and whatever it was deficient, we, 
we signed up. Um, but, but, but my point is, is that I just, I just want to encourage you to, 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 to think about that, to pray about that, and to be a part because I'm telling you, we have so many opportunities right now to do so many things, to reach so many people. And we just want to be able to meet every good work when it comes.